finishing up our study of the book of Second Peter. And then next week, we have one more Sunday left of the year. And the plan is to uh, finish up the Revelation class, actually, with our last class period uh, next week. We have two chapters left of Revelation. So uh, this week on Wednesday, we'll, be, we'll have a, the, the second last chapter. And then on Sunday morning, we'll have the last chapter of Revelation uh, to go over in Bible class next Sunday. And that will put us finished all, with all of our Bible classes for the year. And we'll have the new year to start fresh and anew. And we'll be picking up right in the Gospel of John to start uh, 2024. So hope you're looking forward to that. We're going to be looking forward and studying the, the Gospels, or Gospel of John together moving forward. Um, I'm going to ask, Brother Jeff, would you mind opening us up in a prayer this morning? Father God, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day you've given us for this first day of the week that we have to come together and worship you and praise you. <laughs> awesome God, Father, that you are to us. Father, we thank you for your word, for the light that it that lights our pathway while we're here on this walk on earth. Father, we pray that you would be with us be with Caleb as he directs our minds in your will for us. Father, we thank you so much for all you do for us, for all you bless us with each and every day. And thank you so much, most of all, for Christ and the hope that we have through him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Those who in, we're picking up in 2 Peter chapter 3, looking to finish our study this morning. Do so you want to go ahead and open up there? I would like to begin by kind of just briefly going over again what we talked about last week in 2 Peter uh, 3. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 is on the shorter side. Uh, also, the thoughts are very linear, so it makes sense to kind of follow through them as we go, or follow through the whole thought. Uh, but let's go ahead and begin by reading through up to what we talked about last week. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Peter writes, This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring you up, stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that existed, that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. I've said it every, almost every class period, I'm going to say it again. Second Peter is a very extremely practical book. Every chapter has one central theme of the, the theme of things that Peter wants us to remember. And in chapter 3, the thing that Peter is focusing on is the coming of the Lord. He's focusing on the return of Jesus and what is it going to look like when, when uh, the day of judgment comes our way. And so this first paragraph here, this first thought he had, we, the time where we spent our, our study time last week was looking at People who are overlooking the coming of Jesus Christ. And the point he was making there is that they are deliberately overlooking this fact. That God is, is who he says he is and that God has proven himself all throughout time. He quotes the example of Noah, how the world was created through water and, and the word. But also by means of these, the world was also destroyed. God followed through on his promise that he was going to destroy the world and he did that. And people overlook that fact for some reason. And that picks us up to where we are now in verse 8. And I don't want to spend too much time on what we talked about last week, but that's kind of where he's coming from. And now we come to where we, we left off in our, our study last week in verse 8. Let's read through 8 through 13 now. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, 
waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So we were just looking at how Peter says, hey, these people who are, who are scoffing in the last days, talking about, hey, you know, is God still really going to bring his judgment? After all, we're still here. He promised that a long time ago, and he hasn't followed through on his promise yet, so is he still going to follow through on his promise? They're overlooking this fact, and now he says, you don't make the same mistake. You yourself do not overlook this one fact. And the fact that he gives that the, with the Lord, the one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient toward you, and he's wishing that all, they're not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So that brings me to a, a question that I think is pretty obvious by the, by the way this text is written here. But is God's perspective different than ours? Very much so. Very much so. How, how is his perspective different? What, what enables his perspective to be different? He knows everything, okay? I'm really glad you said that because that goes exactly to the point that I was trying to draw us to. I really, one thing I love about this section of the text here is that I think this is one of the underlying scriptures that, without directly saying it, I really think it's speaking towards the omniscience of God. And so I want us to take some time to look at a few passages that, that teach us about the omniscience of God. Turn me over to 1 John chapter 3. <coughs> Actually, let's do this a little differently. Let me get someone to turn to 1 John chapter 3. Someone else turn to Matthew chapter 10. And then someone turn to Psalm 139. Who's going to read 1 John 3? Okay, who's going to read Matthew 10? Okay, Scott's going to read Matthew 10, and who will read Psalm 139? Okay, Gigi will read Psalm 139. Jeff, if you wouldn't mind, please read 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. By this we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and that is all things. Okay. So first John chapter three here is very clear. It's talking it's talking about multiple things at the same time here. But one thing he mentions at the very end of verse twenty is that God knows everything. God is greater than our hearts. And God knows everything. That already is, is an omniscient statement right there, that God knows everything. There's nothing that is kept outside of his knowledge there. Uh, Scott, would you mind reading Matthew 10, 29 through 30? Are not two sparrows sold for a sin, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. For the very heirs of your head are all numbered. <laughs> Therefore, do not fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. Thank you, Scott. Yes, you did, you did good. Uh, so we have 1 John 3 that is very clear, very un, uh, you know, end statement there in verse 20. But God knows everything. Here in the, Ma in the Gospel of Matthew here, we have written in about having no fear. But notice what is described here about God. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them fall to the ground from, apart from your father. Even the hairs of your head are numbered. God knows even these little details. It, he takes the time and cares enough to know the little details. There's, there's nothing that he doesn't know. Even the, the number of hairs on your head. Things that we can't comprehend. Things we can't physically count ourselves. Uh, I mean, I guess it's possible for us to actually physically count our hairs. But who wants to sit down and practically do that? It's not, it's not really practically within our control to be able to do that uh, without a lot of extra extraordinary means. But God knows these things already because he knows everything. He is omniscient. Uh, and then Sister Gigi, please read for us a Psalm 139 verses 1 through 4. O oh Lord, you have served for me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Thank you. So again, 
a psalm, even in the Old Testament, speaking to the knowledge of God. You search me, you know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. Literally, you can read my mind. You know my thoughts as I'm thinking them. You, you search on my path and lying down are acquainted with all my ways. Uh, but even before I speak a word, you know what I'm going to say. It speaks to the fact that God is omniscient. And so certainly, go, let's bring that back to Second Peter now for a second. So underlying what Peter says here, I really think that he, he's speaking to the omniscience of God in an underlying way. The point is, do not overlook the fact that God sees more than we see. And so you need to continue to trust him while the rest of the world is not trusting him. In fact, they're skeptically scoffing at what he has said. Is he really going to continue on and follow through on his promise? We've been here all this long and he hasn't done it yet. Is he ever really going to do it? You don't be that way. Don't make that same mistake. In fact, be humble and remember that God knows everything. He even knows things that you don't know. His perspective is beyond yours. And sometimes when we interact with the world and we speak to them about God, you know, you hear comments made about, you know, well, what, what about this? What about that? Uh, how, does God know all, everything? And, and so we, we often find ourselves wrestling with them over these kinds of subjects. But yes, God does know everything. And his perspective is greater than ours. He knows better than we do. And Sometimes that's a, that's a point that is hard for people to wrestle with, um, but it's true, and the scriptures teach you that, and for the, those of us uh, as Christians who believe in God, uh, this is another thing we learn about him. His perspective is greater than ours, and sometimes it's going to require some humility on our part to accept that and to accept we may not be able to understand just how, how true that is. Thoughts, comments, questions about that? Facts, right? These aren't. Um, I mean, we're talking. I mean, he knows everything. Even the hairs on your head. These are facts, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. And is there, or is there something more to your question, I, or just just pointing out? These are. Are you suggesting it's just facts that God knows, or is there? I don't know, I'm not sure if there's more to your question that I'm, I'm missing. Well, in the book of Revelation, most all of that. Actual. Yeah, symbolism. Symbolism, right? And so, is he using the, the grains of sand on the beach or the hair in your head as, as facts, or is that just a symbolism? I mean, that seems like a waste of time. To, to use symbolism? No, to count the hair on your head. Oh. Well, when he's got. Is he, is he actually talking here like he, when he knows everything, he even knows it right down to the hairs on your head, or is he saying that? That would be something that he's using as an example. Yeah, I, I think there's a sense in which it's both. I think he does literally know how many sands are on the earth, but also at the same time, it's a metaphor using to, to speak to just how much he knows in comparison to how much we know. Um, one of my favorite things that I ever learned uh, my first year at college was that the more you learn, the more you realize how much you don't know. And that's certainly true the more and more we study the scriptures as well. How much more is here? How much more do we learn every time we study the scriptures? And to think that God knows all that, this is his mind already. But then even when it comes down to the, even his metaphor there, the, the hairs of your head, the sand on the, sea, on the shore, I mean, his knowledge is just that much more ex expansive than mine. And it's 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 a phenomenal thing to try to wrap your minds around that there's a being that can know that much. Uh, Jim? Well, it's kind of beyond our comprehension because if you created the universe by speaking it into existence, okay, or you go to Genesis chapter one, you did all this on one day one, all this on day two, you know, that's a lot, of, lot to cram into 24 hours. This is what you guys described as the 24 hour day. It's just beyond our comprehension, Yeah. you know? And, uh, so maybe you can't count. <laughs> you know, it's all there. Yeah. I do think there's a certain sense of which it is significant that even though, yes, you know, what, what's the purpose of, of knowing every single hair on your head, every, knowing every single grain of sand, you know, what, what value would that be for us? Well, there's not much value to us because we have nothing to do with that. But for him, who is outside of the, the, the limits that we have of time, of, you know, physical limitations and, and, and all things like that, I mean, 
yes, it may not be necessarily helpful to him, but it's still the fact that he can know that he has the time and the ability to know that still speaks to just the fact he knows everything and how much greater he is than we are. Uh, sorry, go ahead and then Kevin. The reason that I ask that is because reading the scriptures, that's the hardest thing for me to do is to unwind all this stuff that is hyperbole or is it an actual fact? I mean, is he saying it for a reason or is it something that he's using as an example or is it a necessary inference? You know, it's just, you, you got to be able to know when when it's meaningful to your daily life or is it just something he's throwing out there just to kind of make a, a statement that would give some kind of description about what he's trying to indicate. Yeah. And that's one of the greatest pursuits of mankind trying to... And the mind of God constantly learning, diving deeper. He's indicating that he knows everything, even the dumb little stuff that you think are not important. Like yeah. Yeah, what's the purpose of the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1? I mean, someone, somebody doesn't know anything about the Bible. They read Matthew chapter 1. It's a good place to start. You know, we read about Jesus and they start with the genealogy. What in the world is this here for? Well, I'm sure he didn't say in this scripture everything. We don't know everything that, that went on in, in, in the first century. Okay, so everything is not documented here. So the things that are must be the things he wants us to know. Exactly. Yeah. And so the things he wants us to know seems sometimes to me unimportant. Like my hairs on my head is increasing and he's busy <laughs> and always changing. You know, so I just wonder sometimes if the things that I'm reading is meaningful that I need to know or is it stuff that he's using for an example. Yeah, and, and you make a very good point though too, and I think that, that points us back to the point that Peter's trying to make here again. Uh, you know, don't overlook the, this fact that, I mean, it's, you know, his perspective is greater than ours, but it doesn't always strike me as important or something that I need to know right now. He took the time to record it. It's there. It's there for some purpose. Uh, even this week, I, I can't remember exactly what, what, I was, what it was I was reading, but I was thinking about how, uh, you know, you read the scriptures and there are, there are points that you read about, oh yeah, that's cool and, and I don't know what that means to me, but then later on you may have a conversation about somebody and then you remember that one specific detail that makes this point about a conversation that's a new conversation you never had before. And so, I mean, e there are certainly details that we don't always see their usefulness until way later, uh, but still knowing it and knowing that it's there uh, is, is important. It helps us grow. Uh, Kevin, your hand first and then Gigi. I think it serves two two purposes here. One, it shows that God is on You know, he talked. You know, David talked about how he knew him when he was in his mother's womb. Okay, he that, that's not a figure of speech. He knew what was going on. He formed him in his mother's womb, and it goes from that moment all the way up until death. And I think him saying that he even knows the number of hairs that we have on our head. He knows you and knows you that much and cares about you that much. He knows every little detail about you, your life, and what makes you, you. He formed you, so he knows you. And I think that brings comfort to us to know that, I mean, it, put that into perspective. The God that created the heavens and the universe and everything that we see and even the things that we don't see knows me that intimately and cares about me that much. To say, I don't even know how many hairs you have on your head, which for me is, you know, you have to count anymore. But, you know, it, it, just, it just goes to show I knew you before you even came into this world, and I'm going to know you, you know, if you, if you stay my child, I'm going to know you even after you leave this world. Yeah. Did you were following? Very. Just that the hair on your head is just an intimate relationship because everybody's hair is different. Probably has a So back to what Alan was saying as well too. I mean, take that same idea that God cares about us so much that He would take the time to know the numbers, of hair, the number of hairs on our head. Now switch that around. Would we take that amount of time to know the details of His Word as well? May not use everything. May not strike me as important or something that's extremely useful to me. But there's still a certain sense of which we are demonstrating a love for Him as well by growing in the knowledge of Him and His Word and His mind, that I, kn I know the details that are revealed to me, and I know them like the back of my hand. Um, so there, there's a certain sense of that as well. 
Um, and not always are they super applicable to us, and, but not only, let me rephrase that. It's not that they're not applicable to us, but not always do we, I, I think, understand and recognize their usefulness to us until later on, or perhaps we never do sometimes, but it's there for us to, to learn it if we would seek it out. So, other thoughts, comments about the omniscience of God? All right. Let's see, we read through verse 8 and 9. Um, God is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Again, Peter's speaking to the fact that God's perspective is different, and what we may see as slow is not slow with him. Really, it's patience. That's a pretty significant idea to, to think about, that I can make the same mistake over and over again, and you might think, you know, why doesn't God just do something about it? Why doesn't he zap that out of me, or why doesn't he zap me for uh, the things that I'm doing wrong? It's patience. And so there's a very real point here about the patience of God being demonstrated to us with the time that we are given. Every day is a blessing from God, not just because it's an opportunity to do the work that he's given us, it's another day of patience that, you know, I didn't do so good yesterday, but he's given me another day to try again today. You know, maybe I didn't do so good today. I'm going to try again tomorrow, if, if the Lord permits. Every day that we have is another day of patience for God, or f from God, because he's not wishing that any, any should perish, but he's hoping that all of us will reach repentance. Um, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Any last thoughts, questions on verses 9 and 10 there before we jump to 11 and following? Anything about the patience of God, uh, about the destruction of the world here? Any questions? All right, verse 11. A very natural question occurs here in verse 11 from the conversation Peter's having here. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, thus to be dissolved what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for the hastening and, and hastening the coming of the day of, of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Again, a very natural question arises from verse 11. What sort of people ought you to be as we're waiting for the coming of the Lord? What do you think? You, you see this question that Peter's asking? What do you think? How would you respond to his question there in the text? What sort of people ought we to be? Strong, healthy, loving, compassionate. Okay. What else? This certain part of it? Godliness. Godliness? Yeah, that's a, that's a direct reference back to chapter 1. You remember the virtues we read about? Uh, let's see, verses... 5 through 11. Uh, Again, chapter 1 was a, was a very practical chapter about remember how to live and why you are to live this way. Uh, so there's, there's certainly things that we are to be doing. Uh, and and the, the question is a very natural question, again, that comes from his conversation. What sort of people ought we to be in lives of holiness and godliness? It's, re it's pointing us back to chapter 1 with the practical things he gave for us there to be thinking about. Uh, I also think another passage that goes very well with this. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to read verse 12 through 18. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So there in Philippians, Paul, you know, he's, he's writing to them, he's alluding to the fact, again, that he's in prison at the time of writing this letter to them, but he gives them, again, a very practical, this is how you are to be living right now. Living as lights in the world, uh, you're working at your salvation in fear and trembling, recognize that it's God working in you when you're doing the work that he's given you to do, um, 
how, how are you to do that? Do it without grumbling or disputing. Uh, prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Prove yourselves to be children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. You're shining as lights in the world. All of these things are a mentality, an attitude, an identity that one lives as we're waiting for the coming of the Lord. Again, it's not just, it's not just the practical thing itself to do. Uh, it's not about, doing, about the specifics of what we're doing. It's about doing it because that's who I am. I'm doing it, and that's who God has asked me to be, and that's the kind of character I'm learning to be. I'm learning to be like Christ, the kind of person that does this because that's who he is. Those are the kind of people that we are to be. These are the kind of people we ought to be in lives of holiness and godliness as we're waiting. Uh, and we're waiting, the prom- we're waiting for the promise of being with God in heaven, waiting for the new heavens and the new earth there. Uh, other thoughts, observations, comments about the livelihood of a Christian while we're waiting for the return of Christ here. Verse 14 to the end. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom wisdom given him. Let me back up. I'm sorry, verse, verse 15 again. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. These final words here of Peter in in this letter Kind of they summarize all the big points that he's been making throughout the entire letter. There, you can see a summary of his, of his main message from chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 here. Um, let's break through that and, and identify that. Uh, since you are, are beloved, you are waiting for these, be found diligent to him without spot or blemish and at peace. Again, calling back to the mind, what kind of people are you supposed to be living as? How are you supposed to be presenting yourselves? We also just read in Philippians again, uh, you know, live as children of God holy and without blemish. The idea that there's no spot on you that you could be accused of. Any spots that might taint the white robes that you're wearing to use image that we read about in Revelation. Uh, be found diligent to be found without any of these spots and blemish and to be at peace. So again, a call to mind about the way that we are to live as we're waiting for, for the return of God or the return of Christ. Verse 15, calling back to what he just said earlier in the chapter. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Take the patience of God as salvation, Paul's point is here. Um, Then he mentions, again, talking about Paul's letters, there are some things in them hard to understand. The ignorant and unstable twist them to their own destruction, calling back to the, the whole conversation about false prophets in, in 2 Peter chapter 2. What are the false prophets going to do? We're to test the spirits to see whether or not they're from God. Are they trying to serve God or are they trying to serve their own appetites? What motivations do they have for, for doing what they do? And we need to be checking and, and testing people uh, for false prophets and false teachers there. So he's calling back to that again. Um, the ignorant and unstable, they're going to twist the, the, the scriptures and Paul's words to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Um, and then the warning of that, verse 17, you, you know this is going to happen beforehand. Take care that you're not carried away by the error of the lawless people and lose your own stability. Uh, so again, protect yourself and rather grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, and giving the glory to him until the day of eternity. Uh, so that's the letter of Second Peter there. Any observations anybody would like to make uh, about verse 14 through 18 here? Second Peter chapter 3. We were just reading verses 14 through 18. Well, scripture is the filter. I must 
scripture we know righteously interpreted, and I believe that that will be my take is supervision spiritual service. So I go to my preacher and ask him what do you think of this, I think of this, and then uh, good preachers from the Church of Christ are me to the context of scripture and history and everything. So that's what I've kept me safe in mind. That's good. Not thinking that I know it all, I do not. I'm sorry? I'm not thinking that I know it all, I do not. No, I don't either. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Crucial in, in 15, and account the long suffering of the Lord as salvation. To me, that says that He's giving me more and more and more and more chances to come to salvation, uh, even even in my iniquity. And even though it may not look like I will ever search for salvation, God is still there giving me chances, trying to show me what to do and how to do it. That's a very good thought. That's actually going to, I don't want to give too much on this because that's gonna, that actually ties into what we're going to talk about for the lesson this morning. We're going to take a look at, take a look at Jacob in his wrestle with God. And uh, part of the idea of what we're going to talk about in the sermon there is this idea that, that we can wrestle with God when we're reading through the scriptures. God gives us something that we're to do this, but in the moment, I want to do something else. I, you, you want me to do that? I don't want to do that. And we wrestle with that. And so, very much so, I mean, every day, as Peter's talking about here, that God gives us another day of patience. And he says to see that as salvation. Every opportunity we have to do what God says rather than do what we want, when we are faced with challenges like that, it is an opportunity uh, for us to do what God says. He's giving us another chance for salvation, just like you're saying, Bruce, in verse 15 here. Um, it's another opportunity. He keeps giving us chances over and over and over again. Um, and so there, a thought there that... Uh, came to my mind about when we struggle and we're learning and we're growing uh, just as he says in verse 18 grow in the grace and knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ uh, take those opportunities that he gives you to do what he has commanded you to do um, and grow uh, don't be stagnant but grow and see that as an opportunity to grow and see his patience there um, other thoughts to, to build off of that jay i think throughout the ages people have asked the question you know, how should we live our lives, or how best to live our lives. And uh, you see this in the old Greek philosophers. And now Paul takes a crack at it. You know, so how should we live our lives? Well, he gives a very brief answer, but Christianity in itself is kind of the answer to that question. And well, there's lots of philosophies that you know, ended isms like materialism or individualism or hedonism or all sorts of different ways you can choose to live your life. I don't know how you sum up Christianity into a real simple ism, but that's that's what we need to do. Well, the best way that I know to <laughs> I don't know if there's a, there's an ism to it, but uh, when you said that, you know, I don't know the the simplest way to. Uh, to simply explain it, it makes me think of what's written in the Old Testament, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, where is it? I know Jesus said this. I, it's not coming to me off the top of my head. But he says, um, you know, the greatest commandment is this, but the second is like it, that you should love your neighbor. I'm trying to, does anybody know where that is off the top of their head by any chance? It's not coming to me at the moment. Yeah, I, I'm thinking it's in John, but it might not be in John. Does anybody else know off the top of their head? Yeah. yeah. Well, you're not wrong, uh, um, but no, you, you're right. Like the, Christian, Christianity certainly is an answer to those questions. You know, how am I to live my life? And it's different than what the, the rest of the world offers. Um, another thing you made me think of. I'm trying to find the message or the passage here. Uh, turn with me to Acts 17, real quick. Turn to Acts chapter 17. I'm looking at verses 22 and following here with Paul uh, addressing the Areopagus, but Brother Jay was, was mentioning, you know, 
the world, uh, philosophers, everybody has these questions of how are we supposed to live our lives, you know, all these different isms that people try to live as a way of living their life. Um, we see Paul interacting with that as well uh, in the ancient world. And we see that here. Acts 17 is my favorite example of that. Let's see. Uh, let's start reading in verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on, the face, on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted pe periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God, and perhaps feel their way toward him, and find him. And there's more he says there. But you think of the setting in which Paul is speaking to you again. He, you know, hey, I perceive that you are very religious. I perceive that you have all these different philosophies. And, and again, the Areopagus is that's a place where you have people like that going and they're, they're trading around these different uh, ideologies and ways of living. And Paul meets them where they are with that. This altar that you have to the unknown God, I'm going to tell you about him. He is the true God. And what does he say about God here? This passage really speaks to, I think, underlies and speaks to what, what Jay, you're bringing out uh, about the way we live our lives and, and who are we serving and who do, uh, who do we serve as God. Uh, it's very interesting also what, what it says about God here. Uh, let me find the verse again. Um, well, I'm just going to start in verse 24 again because just hear how, he's, again, he speaks about God. God who made everything or made the world and everything in it. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples made by man, not served by human hands. This phrase is, is interesting about God here. As though he needed anything. Now, what does that say about God? As though he needed anything. God doesn't need us. And yet, this is the God that Paul is proclaiming to them. Uh, and this is the God we're talking about even here in Second Peter. Remember, this, this God who has said he's going to do this, he's proven himself to be this very thing. He doesn't need anything, but he has followed through on his word before. He will do it again. Remember how you're supposed to be living. Remember how people are going to come and twist the scripture speaking about him. And re remember that he's going to send his son to come back and to judge us at the end. So that um, just made me think of that there, uh, pulling all that together. Yes, sir, comment. <coughs> And also, in all these epistles, speaking in them concerning these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the honor and unsettled prevent, as also they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. Then, beloved, you know beforehand what's left being led away by the error of the lawless, you fall from your own steadfastness. Steadfast. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So we want to hear, hear a lot of people say, pulling different type of directions, and, and we have already confirmed this is the truth and this is what it is, and we are running it wrong and blah, blah. This is the sound of All the churches say the same thing about this themselves. So. But here, verse 8, 8, 16 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as the example to what to do to please God. So, uh, yeah, he, he, he points us the author and the future of our faith. He, he puts his, his eye on the goal of the high calling of Jesus Christ. So, you know, it doesn't matter what everybody says. Look at Jesus, point to Jesus, learn from Jesus. He's the example, he's the way he's to be the life. So he's, he's just pointing to Jesus Christ. All right, so I'm going to first numbers. The verse you were thinking of earlier is Matthew 22. Now, okay, so I'm going down to Matthew 22. I thank you for that. Uh, did you have anything else you want to add, Kevin? No. Just uh, okay. Uh, verse? Well, God capsulizes himself in, in the verse where it says God is love. Yeah. That, that I think, explains all. You know, Nothing else to be said. 
You know, uh, I agree with that. Uh, certainly that's in the scripture, so I don't disagree with that. And certainly that is um, a way of describing how God is. Um, understanding what that means, I think sometimes we're limited by our own understanding of what that means though as well. And so what, how did the scriptures further elaborate on it to help us understand what that means that he is love? And that, I don't think those two things are contradictory, but I certainly think they help explain each other. Um, so good there. Um, well, we got through Second Peter or Second Peter three really quickly this morning. <laughs> Any last thoughts? Or, go ahead. And Jesus explained the love. Was so God is love. Jesus explained the love. Love one another as I have loved you, right? And if we look at Jesus's love, his love was one of sacrifice. He showed his love with complete sacrifice. So if we're going to love as he did, we have to be able to sacrifice for one another. And that gets us back to God. In God, it's almost like that infinite circle that, that's there. Uh, I'm all of this, but all of this is love. That, that reminds me of a verse that says, not all everybody, the one that says, Lord, Lord, roll into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of God. So, you know, he, he focuses to obedience. Jesus has the goal in the example. I think it's really good. Good to talk back Kevin. Oh, uh, Kevin will have a last comment, and then we're going to end my class. So, you know, like Bruce was saying, you know, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world. But then you go to First John three sixteen, and it kind of says the same thing. You know, this is how we have come to know Him, uh, or this is how we have come to know love. He laid down His life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So it is sacrificial. It all points back to Jesus, sir. <clears throat> Thank you for your comments and questions. We're going to finish Revelation next week to finish up our Revelation class. So look forward to that. And then going into 2024, we're going to go into the Gospel of John.